Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome back to Find My Past from Home. My name is Ellie. I'm Senior Community Executive for Find My Past. And it's been a couple of weeks since I've done one of these. So it's really, really good to be back with you. Please say hello in the comments, say where you're tuning in from. We're gonna be chatting all about photographs today and how you can use photographs with your family history, how to organize them, how to store them, how to preserve them all things to do with photographs, which is really exciting. But I am not alone in this venture today. I have a really, really special guest. I'm so, so delighted to welcome the photo detective herself, Maureen Taylor, who I'm going to add to the stream now. Welcome, Maureen. Hey, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. It's morning here, but afternoon where you are. Ellie. Thank you so much for agreeing to, uh, to come on find my past from home with us today. I'm so, so excited for this session. It's a real, real pleasure. Um, in case any of you don't know Maureen, um, she is known as the photo detective and she's a frequent speaker on photo identification and preservation and on family history as well. The author of several books has appeared on national US television, written for publications such as the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times to name but a few and is a contributing editor for Family Tree Magazine. So really, really, really special one today. Maureen, is there anything else I've missed? Is there anything else you'd <laughs> like to impart with our community? No, I think that sums it up, Ellie. That's a really nice introduction. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> uh, so in terms of what we're going to be doing today, everybody, um, we're going to do a very, very short interview segment with Maureen, which is exciting. Then we're going to move on to some advice. We've also had some questions in from you guys in advance as well. So we're going to do those. Um, if you do have a question that you would like to ask Maureen now, please do add it into the comments. If you can put question at the beginning of your question, that would be super helpful for us picking out questions towards the end. And excitingly as well, I don't want to spoil anything. Um, Maureen's also got a, a little case study to share with us as well. So fantastic. Now let's welcome a few of you in the comments before we get started. Uh, let's have a look, see the scroll back up here. Lots of you here already, which is really, really, um, really exciting. Uh, we've got Sally saying uh, hello from near Oxford. Hello. Uh, we've got Andrea from Stoke-on-Trent. Marilyn from New Jersey. Roxanne in Stormy, Utah. Nearly forgot it was Wednesday. Don't the days just disappear with us, Roxanne? Honestly. Uh, we've got Janet from my, my native North Wales. Anya in Scotland. Claire over in Australia, it's cold there apparently. I've uh, got Rosie with us, lots of people today. This is fantastic guys, thank you so much for joining. We've also got Niall in the comments with us today as well. So he's going to be uh, speaking to you guys and also sharing any relevant links. And Maureen's also got a gift for you as well that he will share in the comments. So if you'd like to uh, take advantage of that gift, you can. Okay, so let's start, Maureen, if that's okay with you. Um, and there's just there's just a few sort of questions I had about yourself, your career, and your work. I mean, I I personally love photographs, historical photographs. Anybody who has watched any of our, my particular Find My Past from Home sessions before, I I talk about photographs a lot and how much I love them and how and how emotional they can be as well. So what I really want to ask you first of all is how did your love of photographs come about? Oh, well, I was just a little kid and my mom used to take out the boxes of photographs and they're just snapshots. There's nothing particularly old about them. And she would tell us stories. And every time we pulled out the box of photographs, she had another story to tell about the same picture or the person in the picture. And so early on, I was exposed to family photographs. And then I started studying history. I was always a history fanatic. And I realized that photographs went back a lot further than my family story. And I just, I love them. I love all of them from the beginning of photography to the present. There isn't a picture I don't like. And so I really credit my mom with instilling that interest of photography. Yeah, and I think 
photo, the photographs in, in themselves for me are beautiful things to look at. Yeah. But it's the stories behind them. That's what makes them truly special, as you say. Um, and I imagine that you've amassed quite a collection over the years. Um, do you have a favorite photograph from your personal collection? Oh, from my all? personal collection. Yeah, could could you share one? Could you could could you even pick one, I suppose? Uh, <laughs> I have one. Might be like that is my photo child. mystery. <laughs> because we all have them. And I'll put it right up here. This one, this is my uh, oldest family photograph on my dad's side. And it dates from somewhere around 1900. And for some reason, we didn't find it until he was already deceased. But my mom claims, you know, this is my great grandfather and this is my grandfather. And the rest of the people are a bit of a mystery. I've been able to narrow it down and pick out some other people that are family members, I'm pretty sure, based on resemblances in earlier photo, uh, later photos. Um, but this one, you know, just sits on my desk. Obviously, I just pulled it out. Uh, <laughs> no, you just happen to have it. Down. I just happen to have it. It sits here and taunts me like, is it my great grandmother's family or is it my great -grand grandfather's family? And I have amassed a massive collection of research photographs because really the only way to learn about photo history is sure there's lots of books and you can see my library behind me. That's just part of it. And the only way to really learn about photo history is to look at photographs and to look at all the photographs that people send me for consultations. I and mean, then it's, it's amazing what people have in their collections. Um, and that must be so special about your line of work is that you get to see an incredible array of people's personal histories. That must be just so special. You just, I just never know what someone's going to send. I just, I just never know. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Is, is there anything that's truly surprised you? Uh, at this point in my career, nothing surprised me. <laughs> I Early imagine. on, there were things that surprised me. Um, a few, a year ago, a woman uh, came forward with a photo album. And in the photo album, she actually had a picture of a Western United States woman sort of folk hero picture that her, I think it was her great grandfather had taken as a little kid, just running around this little town out west and just snapped a little snapshot of her and there it was in the album wow. and that surprised me uh but mostly no I have seen I think at this point I've seen it all but go ahead and challenge me that's, <laughs> that's a challenge to all of you at <laughs> like home <a> challenge. <laughs> I really like a challenge I think we all love a challenge as family historians and genealogists don't we and yeah. you know Photographs are a really important part of, of genealogy, but why do you think that is? What is it about photographs that are so special to family historians? We see ourselves in them. There's that connection. It's not a census record. It's an actual picture with people's faces. And when you research those images, we get a greater sense of not only who we are, our identity, but our connection uh, to the images as well. I will say, I do have one surprising thing. <laughs> so I bought this image in an antique shop, which I often do. And I've been working on this mystery on my blog and I've asked people for assistance with it. And it's a man by the name, maybe, of Helmuth Voigt. That's possibly his name. But in on the back of the image, it's a beautiful photograph. Go check it out on my blog. But on the back of it, there's an argument between two siblings. This is dad. This is not dad. And he was a loser. <laughs> and That's so brilliant. the story is unfolding uh, as the more I put it out there, um, people are adding their little, their little hints as to what it might be. But it's, it's fascinating to me that two siblings would take the back of a photograph to have an argument. Yeah, um, on a similar vein, not quite as dramatic as that. Um, Anybody who's tuned into some of my live sessions before will know that I talk about my uh, paternal grandfather a lot, who, who died many, many years before I was born. And um, we have some photographs of him as, as a young man. And he didn't meet his eldest daughter, who was my aunt, 
until he came back from World War II. And she had some photographs of him. She must have had photographs of him as a, as a three or four year old. Yeah. And you can see on some of these ones that we've got that she's sort of written on the back, like my daddy and things like that in like beautiful childlike handwriting. Um, but yeah, going back to what you said about sort of seeing yourselves in them, I think that rings so true. It's it's more it's 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 almost like when you have a photograph taken of say you and your father or you and your mother or you and your sibling you see you see resemblances, but then you look you, you know you've you've got a photograph from say a hundred years ago, and you can you can pick out little traits. I, I once came across something in a oh, in a it, it was a mug shot of a somebody in the, in the crime records and it was somebody of somebody who I'm absolutely related to but I haven't worked out how yet because you know everybody was the name overthrow is somehow related to me and <laughs> this man looked like my grandfather he had the same sort of spaced out expression and it's it's just so bizarre immediately I was like I'm definitely related to him <laughs> it was so strange I found <sighs> a family photograph on a Facebook page on like a local history Facebook page of a guy I thought I would never, the, the man in this photograph, that big photograph's father that I thought I would never see a picture of. Wow. And I, and I picked him right out because I was like, oh, I, I know I know exactly which one he is. I don't have to guess. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing, isn't it? It's it's when you see that, that photograph for the first time as well. And if you've got a personal connection to it, there's something so it's so, so moving and, and emotional about that. Um, but yeah, we've we've talked a little bit about your blog um, and your website. Um, but I wondered if you could share with our community. I mean, you, you do offer a range of services, don't you? Um, could you just go into those in a little bit more detail, just in case anybody's curious? Sure. I offer single and uh, package photo consults where we meet one on one uh, via virtual just like we're doing today only it's not public it's private and you get a recording either audio or video and then the more photographs you have the less expensive the console becomes because i want to see your photograph collection i want to help you put it all together and then as part of that with all of our lockdowns and, and lack of travel i have offered more courses on my website so i'm putting together classes for the fall and they're usually about once a month and I keep the cost of them um, fairly reasonable because again the goal is for you to be able to work with your family photographs and do what I do with pictures so that they don't get thrown out uh, so that's so pretty much my happens, goal at this point is putting together classes that people really want to take and that they can learn from and the way to do that I know that Niles shared my newsletter link in the chat if you sign up for my that free cheat sheet, five questions to ask about a family photo, you get added to my mailing list. You can get off at any time, uh, but it tells you uh, when when I'm doing events like this and specials and sales, and also the classes that I offer just mostly to my list. Fantastic! So if anybody. It's the <laughs> if anybody is interested in going beyond the advice that Maureen uh, is kindly sharing with us today, um, all the information is on her website. Yes. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about, and this may tie into many of your questions for Maureen, um, but I, I, you know, I get to get there, go there first, basically, and ask all, my, all of my questions first. Um, so it's, this is sort of more an advice segment. It's going to be quite general, but I'm hoping it's going to be useful for all of you at home. So the first question I've got for you is, is very broad and hypothetical. So let's say, for example, that my grandmother finally decides to give me the stash of her family photos that I've been asking for for years. Um, yes, yeah, this is an ongoing saga. Let's say she actually gives me these photographs. Um, what is the first thing I should be doing with them? Oh, it's such a it's such a gift, and yet people <laughs> become incredibly overwhelmed by the whole idea of getting a box of photographs. So you should look at them, obviously, and. If it's just a single photograph they've given you, flip it over and see if there's a caption on the back, but always be suspect of the caption because you don't know who wrote it. So what you're looking for when you're looking at all these images are 
uh, like what type of picture is it? Is it, I think in terms of piles, you've got old photographs, you know, before your lifetime, maybe even before your parents' lifetime. Um, that's one sort of pile of things. Then your lifetime, your children's lifetime. And the reason it's important to think about these in terms of these piles is because there are different types of photographs. Like maybe there's snapshots. I know in the UK, photography and in the US, photography totally takes off about 1900. But then you've got digital images of your children or grandchildren, and you've got Polaroid pictures and you've got, you know, all kinds of different things. So when you start getting the pictures, you're going to lay them out and group them by these four groups and then by format within there. Because what you're looking for are like snapshots taken on the same day. Oh, that's a good Or point. of the same person and then tell the story. But do me a favor, everyone. Do not take your photo albums apart. It's like, <laughs> it crushes me. <laughs> Because they tell a story uh, and 99.9% .9 of the time, there's nothing written on the back of the images. It's not worth destroying the story that your ancestor put together. Yes, um, so, the, you know, somebody, somebody's done that on purpose to put it together yes. for, uh, for posterity. No, is that the right word? Yeah, yes. posterity. For future generations. And think about who's in them and who isn't. Who's taking the pictures. So there's lots and lots of questions you can ask about your family photographs. And uh, yeah, as you said, you know, there's so many different ways you can organize them to begin with, just just in the first sort of, it's almost like a recce, isn't yeah, it? This is like a, an early sort, because this sort that you're doing, you know, let's like say you have a pile of snapshots taken by, you can tell who took the snapshots, they're all the same format or whatever. That's where you're going to want to start scanning them so that you create a folder of those images because if you just scan everything like we used to just just begin to pile and go to the bottom um it's hard you, then you have to resort them because when you upload them i know one i think one of your questions is about digital organizing and i would just like to say that as a, a revolutionary concept uh you want to make sure you're scanning by folders so when you start putting them in a digital organizer you can just move that folder in and everything stays the same. But you're anyway, I don't want to get ahead easy. of ourselves. You're making things easier for yourself. You're trying to make things easy. That makes complete you sense. You really want to be able to find them again. That's the thing. <laughs> so the first step would be to take them out, look at them, and you know, lay them out and try and group you're them into sort. group them up a bit. And then you know you can start thinking about scanning. Um, mm -hmm. but what about storing them? Um storing them. Yeah. Um, acid and lignin free materials. This is the little one I'm going to use as an example. So this is in a polyester sleeve. All my photographs are in these polyester sleeves so that I can touch it without putting fingerprints all over it or whatever, hand lotion. Uh, and this protects them. And these are actually fairly inexpensive. And there's a lot of vendors. I believe in the UK, Time Care is one of the companies that I've met and, and spoken with in the US, gaylord.com. Uh, but acid and lignin free sleeves and boxes are the way to go. Pretty simple. Fantastic. Are you, are you going to tell us a bit more the, about the photograph now? Or are you going to keep us in suspense? Well, would you like to know more about this photograph? So <laughs> this is a postcard. It's called a real photo postcard. And on the back, it has uh, a message and an addressee. And I will share my screen. Hold on, let me make this smaller so I can share. I can share the big, uh, this is not, oops. Wow, just my screen just went crazy over here. <laughs> I'm share my screen. We love gremlins here. We have, we yeah. have them on a regular basis. <laughs> it happens. So hold on, I have a lot of little windows, so it looks a little disorganized, but I do know where everything is. So how can I, I share this? If I add that now, there okay. we go. All right. So here's the image. You can see it in front of my camera. It's pretty faded. It's got a message on the back. So one of the things I like to do is improve it. And one of the programs I use is uh, Vivipix. And so you can see what I've done with this, taking it from blah and faded to black and white and suddenly you can see it and they have a new sharpening tool which is great um, to help you do that but then you know everybody's been talking about the my heritage 
um, colorization. This is what my heritage colorization did to this image. That is incredible. It makes it real. So the story, there's a story behind this picture and it says, I am afraid that you will think me, uh, us, hmm, can't read that part. Um, your postcards, because they got postcards. We are spending a month's holiday in the beautiful little village of, and excuse me if I don't pronounce it well, all of you from the UK, it looks like Thornladale to me, uh, near Pickering. You will see we have our photographs taken. I was doing a sketch of the house where we are staying, a typical country uh, grown over with pink roses. Uh, the country around here is beautiful and Thornladale has the reputation as being the prettiest village in Yorkshire. Uh, and it won a competition. She goes on to mention a couple of people and she mentions that the two, two of the women in this photograph are her aunts that she's traveling with. So using Find My Past, I searched in your newspapers. <gasps> what have you found? The prettiest village in Yorkshire. Thorn Liddale was named the prettiest village in Yorkshire in 1907 which dates this picture because I couldn't read the postmark. It so dates it we, that's amazing. We know the woman painting the picture because she signs the card and she tells us that she's the one in the picture painting. Um, that would be a woman by the name of Ethel Cliff. And then we know she has two aunts. So the race is on folks, I want some help with this. If you can look at, and I will put this up somewhere. Um, let me make this smaller. If you anyone can identify this house in Thornladale, that would be awesome. This is the house where they were staying in 1907. She writes this card out to Mrs. Davies and Mrs. Adams in Florence, Massachusetts. So it is a two country search at this point. So I'm looking for it. Um, I mentioned that you can use a digital photo organizer. So I showed you Vivipix. I showed you. Um, what you can do to re you know fix these pictures. Uh, but what you're looking for when you use a digital organizer is you want something with portability. Now I'm on the Family History Metadata Working Group, which is a fairly new group. We're trying to set standards for all these genealogy companies so that photographs can be found. But also when you upload your images to one site, you can they can read what you've added. They can You can edit it and you can export it. So it's called portability. So here we have, there are only a few companies that currently do this. There's uh, memoryweb.me, Forever, Photoshop, Lightroom, um, Adobe Lightroom, uh, and Vivipix has metadata in as well. And then there's that new company, permanent.org, where you can create a permanent archive online. They also have metadata that you can use. But this was done with Memory Web. So I uploaded the image, and I haven't uploaded all these and the back yet, but I can link them. And then you can print this out, and I can share this with anyone. And there's the information that I have up to this point on this picture. Now, I, I'm assuming the amount of information I have in this picture is going to continue to grow, especially as soon as somebody sends me a picture of that little cute little cottage. <laughs> so it's a challenge for all of it's you. It's a <laughs> challenge. If anybody wants to tackle Ethel Cliff, that would be great too. I was uh, on Find My Past this morning looking at passenger lists and uh, natural, you know, all that sort of stuff, trying to figure out is she American or is she um, British and what's the connection? Because um, I just, I love this little postcard. It's it just is gorgeous. beautiful. And her handwriting is so neat. <laughs> and she is really chock full of information. She mentions other people at home in Florence, Mass. So there's a lot of things to look at. Um, this month on my podcast, The Photo Detective, it's all about postcards. I have a guy from the UK who was my first interview for the month. And he divulged that he has one million postcards. I don't think I have one million anything. <laughs> I know, not even I <laughs> you know, have all this stuff, but he has one million. He said he has a storage shed. 
Wow. Wow. So give that a listen. It's a, it's a lot of fun. But anyway, this is my example. What else do you have for me, Ellie? I know you have a whole lot of other questions. I do have a few more. I was just wondering, would you be able to put the um, colorized version back up for us? Of uh, Matthew course. Matthew in the comments is asking to see it again. Yeah, I think that's the best. He'd like to just get a better view of the cottage, which we can see there. Right, we'll leave that up for a moment while we move on. Yeah, it's a so, fun mystery. Yeah, it is. It's fantastic. So if anybody's looking for a bit of a... Uh, a bit of a project. And William asking, where would anyone keep a million postcards? Yes, in a storage unit. Absolutely. Since he was eight. That's amazing. Yeah, that's his Patricia passion. says she has a few thousand of them. That's so impressive. That's pretty impressive, Patricia. Okay. Um, so the next question I had was, what if you come across a photograph or it falls into your possession and it's somebody from your family tree, probably, but you don't know who? How do you work that out? Is it a process of elimination? Are there sort of step by steps that you would go through? I call it my signature five questions, the who, what, where, when and why of a picture. So maybe you don't know the who, but you... Uh, know what type of photograph it is. Like this is a real photo postcard and there are details in here that help you date it like the stamp or the divided back for instance. Um, here's, I, I just bought these. This is a little, a little cabinet card. So I work first from format to develop sort of a time frame. I look at clothing to look at when that might've been taken. And then you estimate how old is the person, you know, where was it taken? If it's a, a place on it, this one has a little, no, this one doesn't have it either. Uh, they might have a photographer's name on it. You can research the photographer using census records and city directories and all the stuff that you have on, on Find My Past and others sites. Uh, and you create sort of a time frame for the image. And then you match that up with your family tree. I know I make it sound easy, sometimes it is, and sometimes it's tricky, which is why I offer consultations. Uh, Cause people get stuck. They're like, well, I think it's this, but I'm not sure it could be this. So I weigh in on the argument. There's a photograph my, one of my aunts found when our, my Nana passed away in, in my Nana's house. And it was just of this unidentified woman. And it said on the back, something like, um, your great niece on her graduation day or something and she's in graduation robes and we get an address from where it was sent from and to I think or, or that it's come from Washington DC and gone to my Nana's family in, in Lancashire but other than that it's been a bit of a mystery trying to find out who exactly is in the photograph and well yeah you also have to think in terms of the fact that our ancestors actually exchanged pictures with family and friends. So if you're thinking this box of pictures came from this person and it must be a direct line, in fact, pictures come to us from all branches of the family. And you have to think about the cousins. I uh, was working with a woman for about on and off for about 10 years. Uh, she's going to be on the podcast in a, a couple of weeks. And she found the same photograph, unidentified in one person's collection and identified in others from four descendants of the, the original couple. So she, as she says, keep looking at all those cousins because they have pictures you might not have. Absolutely. And I think that's great advice for, for all of you watching. If you, if you don't have family photographs, it's hard. go and ask your cousins. Ask your cousins. Search the databases. like you know, all the big sites, they might have pictures on there that you didn't know existed. Exactly. And social media is good for that these days as well. As I said, I found that picture of my great, great grandfather on a local history Facebook page. Absolutely. Okay, let's move on then. So I'm conscious of time, we're already halfway through, which is incredible. Um, so last question for me then is, how can you work if you don't know already how can you work out the rough date or location of a photograph so i start with what picture format is it now in the uk daguerreotypes are not very common uh, but it could be a snapshot of a particular format meaning 
that will help you date maybe when it was taken, when that's a sort of broad based thing. But let's say it's a little carte de visite. You know, we know when these were available. That's an easy search. That gives you a beginning date, might give you an end date. So let's say 1854 to 65. And then you look at the clothing, what are they wearing? Um, you know, when was it taken based on what they're wearing? That's a key feature. So in this, this guy's a little bit bigger, but he's got the tie under the collar and the very tight fitting suit and everything. This pretty much looks like it could be the 1880s. Um, so you've already got clothing clues and all of that. Then you sort of estimate how old do you think he is? And think about how you age, un unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> The older I get, it's just awful. Uh, but you have to think about how people in your family age because every family ages differently. Um, and look, if you have a group portrait, look for the youngest person and the oldest person because um, that can definitely help you. Because Brilliant. I get the waters myself. <laughs> While you're doing that, we've already had some great advice from the community members about your photograph. About your I know. I'm going to scroll back up and we can share a couple of these. Um, let's have a look. Uh, so Matthew being really, really helpful. There is a history society in case you haven't checked that out already. So they might be able to help you. Super exciting. I will reach out to them. Roz suggesting if you haven't already, there might be clues on the US census. I am working on that. It's trickier um, than you might think. <laughs> Ali says um, that Ethel Cliff has her own Wikipedia page. Oh, that's interesting. That's amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. This is a mystery I've really just started working on. So all of this is great. And I will credit all of you when I write my blog post. Thank you so much for this, everybody. This is wonderful. Maybe, um, maybe that painting actually exists somewhere. <gasps> oh, that is amazing. Let's think about that. I'll be looking. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew also saying that the village has a lot of similar thatched buildings. So it might be tricky to narrow down the exact one. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure it can be done. Um, and then William saying, I think it's one of the red tile roofs. So it might actually not be thatch, it might be red tile. Mm -hmm. That's possible. And Sue saying, the photo of Ethel Cliff on Wikipedia has a photo which looks like the lady in the photo. So it probably is her. That's brilliant. I, that is brilliant. And Fiona kindly sharing a link. Thank you, on Fiona. Wikitree I will look at as that well. as soon as we are done. Brilliant, everybody. Thank you so much. This is this is the power of our family history community is we put all our heads together and we get answers. It's fantastic. So thank you, everybody. It's a, an exchange, exchange of knowledge and ideas today. I'm loving it. Yeah, I love it. Um, OK, before we do questions, then um, there's just something else I want to touch on in terms of if you don't already, you know, if you're not lucky enough to have a stash of photographs that's been passed down to you, how you would actually go about finding the odd photograph of your ancestors um, using online resources. So there's just a couple of ones I'd like to highlight that are available on Farmer Pass to Search, which is super, Absolutely. super exciting. And um, without giving too much away, there might be another resource coming to find my past next week. I can't spoil any more than that. Anyway, um, so yeah, there are a number of resources that you can look at. And these include, and are not limited to, newspapers. And what is quite cool with the newspapers is that you can, on Find My Past, you can add the illustrated filter. So you just get illustrations that will include photographs. On the British Newspaper Archive, which is our sister website, you can actually add a photograph tag. So then you just get photographs nice. through, which is great. Very nice. I love using that. I was actually looking up some um, photographs of, uh, of dogs today ahead of International Dog Day, which I believe is next week. 
found lots. Um, the other thing is passport applications and naturalizations. These are amazing. Have you have you used them before, Maureen? I have. And so 20th century passport applications and naturalizations might include a photograph. Yeah. Oh, definitely. They're just fantastic as well. And what I think is quite special as well is sometimes you get people in a photograph together, like if, whether it's a mother and her children or whether it's a husband and a wife. Well, I, Think about our passport photos. I know here in the US, we're not allowed to smile anymore. So you have to just sort of, you know, be straight faced when you pose. And it's just you up against a white background. But the passport photos in the early part of the 20th century can be anything from an individual headshot to a family group. It's the oddest thing, but it's yeah, really I mean, fantastic. as long as I suppose as long as it was a photograph of you, that was pretty much the requirement. Pretty much. And didn't my Find My Past just publish an article on their blog post on how to find photographs on Find My Past? Potentially, yes. There's lots, lots of information. I saw it this morning. <laughs> lots of information on there. Um, the other place to look as well, so particularly, this is particularly good if you've got um, UK ancestors, is our crime records. Um, some crime records do have photographs included. We released a, 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 a more into our crime collection um, a few months ago. And one of the particular record, the record collections within that was uh, an album from Pentonville Prison. And it's about, about 1300 headshots, I think. Um, and most of them have the person's name written on them, which is really, really handy because then you can go cross-reference into the other crime records and into the newspapers, and then you can go into the census records, and the list goes on and on and on. Before right. you know it, it's three in the morning. It happens. Well, and the that's one thing, but criminal photographs date back into the uh, 1860s, I think. I have a couple mm. in my collection because law enforcement believed at that point in time that there was a look. And so they photographed people to have sort of a catalog of what it looked like if you were a thief or a murderer or something. I like never that. knew that. Oh, yes. There was so that's why a... they started taking photographs of them because they thought all criminals looked the same. <laughs> Well, they had they shared things. Plus, it was an identification, right? This one has a scar over the eyebrow or a crooked mouth, or much better. Well, that's than that why in some of I don't know if it's the same in the US, but in the UK ones, they have to show their hands so you can see any distinguishing marks or whether they have all their the digits finger. exactly, right. which I think is just fascinating. Um, another record collection I was exploring only today were um, medical records. Some medical records, historical ones, do also have photographs. I was looking at our Bethlehem, London hospital records, and mm -hmm. some of the some of the case books include photographs. And what I found quite um, quite moving, actually, you know, with these these records have you know long descriptions about the patient in question. You know whether they were suffering from mania or dementia, and it's really really heartbreaking to read all of this. But the photographs sometimes include two separate ones taken you know a year or so apart and sometimes the difference you see it, it's very very stark and it, it's quite it's quite it's quite sad to see actually a friend of mine has a picture of her husband's uh, father uh, the pediatrician that his father went to as a little kid took a picture uh, of his patients every year and attached it to the health record. Oh, wow. Isn't that something? Yeah, this is why you should all be taking photographs, everybody. Photographs are so important. In case yeah, and you, you should look everywhere. You should look yeah. everywhere, leave no stone unturned. Exactly. Um, the last couple of ones I've got for suggestions for you all um, are military records. Now this isn't typical in the UK, in terms of you'll find a photograph in their service record. But if they served in the military, they might have a headshot published in the newspaper, for example. Um, there are also various albums here, there and everywhere. I know there are some that we have for Australian military. We have some headshots. We have a record set of those. So those are a good place to try as well. Very much. 
And lastly, directories, um, so trade directories and things like that. So if your ancestor ancestor had a small business, there may be a um, there may be a photograph in the directories of them. I have seen cases of that happening as well. And newspapers. Do we mention newspapers? Yeah, right at the beginning. Oh, <laughs> did yeah. we mention them right at the beginning? Yes, I think we did. Yeah. Um, it's, it, I say it's late here. It's nearly five o'clock. That's not late. I'm just, it's middle of the week. <laughs> it's the middle of a pandemic week. <laughs> I know, exactly. That's a different week. Okay, Maureen, are you ready to do some questions? Yes. Lovely. Okay, we're going to do the pre-submitted ones first, and then we'll move on to doing as many as we can of the live questions. So if you haven't got your question in for Maureen yet, please add it into the comments. And if you could put question at the beginning that will help us draw them out so we don't miss any uh, but we will try and answer as many as we can so the first question i've got here was um this one came in a little bit earlier so apologies maureen if you've not seen this one um this is from claire and she says i've been scanning my grandpa's photos some of them have descriptions, but some don't, and they're not usually in order. I would like advice about digitizing slides and glass negatives. Okay, so you can digitize slides and glass negatives. Uh, you, if you use a flatbed scanner, you can scan both um, if it has an attachment. So that's one way of doing it. Uh, the other thing you can buy for slides is a little slide scanner, which I don't have on my desk anymore because I've finished all my slides. Um, Kodak makes them and you feed one slide in at a time and it does a very nice job. Uh, I'm not sure how much they cost in the UK. I know how much they cost in the US, but for me it was worth it because I weeded my slide collection at the same time. I got rid of anything without people that didn't have any importance. You know, that tree I saw that was beautiful when I was on vacation, <laughs> doesn't look so good 20 years later, out it went. <laughs> you say uh, that, my, um, whenever I go on holiday, I, I'm, I'm a history nerd, so I take pictures of everything and chances are there's no people in them. And my, my auntie actually always, she laughs at me because when she's looking through my holiday pictures, she's like, there's no photographs of you. Yeah. I'm terrible. Yeah, exactly. I, I have a tendency to photograph plants. Um, me too. I don't know what it is about it, but as I went through all of my slides, I was like, why do I take so many pictures of plants when I'm not much of a gardener? Uh, you can get an attachment uh, for your camera to photograph slides as well. Uh, glass negatives, you can uh, put them up in a window and photograph them and then convert them to a positive. That works as well. There's a lot of tricky ways to do it. So lots of ways. Or I wouldn't recommend sending out the glass negatives, but if you have thousands and thousands of slides and you don't want to spend all that time, you can send them to a company that will do it for you. Um, just go with a high-res scan. Um, somebody in the comments says that universities uh, allow people to sign out equipment such as slide scanners. That's great. In the US, uh, some libraries have uh, spaces in the library with equipment to digitize everything from slides to film. Amazing. So lots of advice there for you, Claire. Hopefully that's helpful for you. Okay, let's move on to Angela. Um, so Angela says, my grandfather served in the First World War. I was told there's an archive of soldiers' photos. Is this correct? Yes, there is. And Angela, I should have brought up this website. So hold on for just a second if I can bring this up. Uh, I'll, I'll share my screen in just a second. There is... Now, here we go. I'm going to I'm going to share this in just a second. I'm going to move it over to my other screen so you can see it. There's this uh, fantastic project. There we go. Um, it's also, you should search the found my past archive to see what there is. But uh, a colleague in the UK, James Morley, he was on my podcast. Um, he created this website called The Street Near You, which is World War I soldiers. And it is amazing. 
uh, and it highlights a lot of the collections that there are. So if you don't find what you need on Find My Past, check out a street near you and check it out anyway. We put years of time into this. So yes, wow. there are plenty of archives. Uh, I know what I'm doing when this live live session finishes. I'm going to go and explore that. <laughs> it is a rabbit hole. You are going to disappear. <laughs> okay. What else? Okay. Next question. Um, we've already gone into this a little bit, um, but maybe we can um, focus on it again. So Adele has asked, I would like to know how to preserve photographs. I inherited lots and they're falling out of albums. They're getting damaged. I plan to scan them. What is the best way to do this and what materials do I need? Yeah, I think she also said she has a lot of those sticky albums, those magnetic Yeah, that albums. was it, yes. Those are super toxic to your images. So in, you have to photograph the page first or scan the whole page so you have a record of where everything is. These are the only albums I recommend people take apart, the sticky ones. Then you want to find an acid and lignin-free album to transfer them back to another album, but keep the order of the images. If you're just in general wanting to preserve your photos, you wanna scan at a really high resolution like 1200 DPI, you will need a portable hard drive for storage for those. Um, and then there are apps uh, that allow you to, they're actually pretty cool, I actually wanna try some on my albums. Um, they allow you, it's a phone app, You photograph the page and then it automatically sort of crops them all and puts them in a folder. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I think it's called Photomime is the one that does that. Um, they don't have the metadata, but they do <laughs> let you um, easily photograph those, those uh, pages. So acid and lignin free and polyester sleeves, that's the basics. If you wanna write on the back of your images, um, you just need a soft lead pencil, just a soft lead pencil, like a 6B or an 8B artist pencil. Um, that's the best. Okay. Lovely. I think that goes on into, into Carol's question quite well, actually, um, who asked, uh, what's the best way to record who is in old photographs? And of course, that, that is how you would do it if, um, if you were doing it manually, sort of on the back. And um, Joy sort of asked about this as well, you know, how can I tag a digitized photo to show the date, location and persons? Um, so there's a couple of things you can yeah. do. So you can write on the back very small, very lightly with a soft lead pencil, never a pen, um, unless it's a, there's a 20th century photo that's hard to write on the back of. And you, also, when you scan the picture, you can scan the photograph with a piece of paper down here. So you scan a piece of paper below it as well with all the information so it stays part of the picture. That's a really good idea, actually. Yeah. Now, the digital organizers should, if you use one of the ones that I talked about that have portability, then you should be able to add information like I did for the memory web very easily. You can edit it, you can share it, you can export it to other platforms. Um, the question is whether or not they can read them. That's <laughs> the problem. Not all sites can read what you've uploaded. So preserving by scanning, uh, digitization is key, and keywords like location and name, and it's all called metadata, the fancy word for the basics of what you know about a picture. Lovely. And I think the last question we had, apologies, um, I don't have the question itself. It's from Claire and it was of a fantastic portrait. Have you got the question there? Fantastic. It's a portrait, not a photograph. So it's pre-photographic and it says, on the back it says, Hannah painted when she was 21. She has a couple of contenders in her tree. Claire, if you are here, um, today I went in my library and looked for where that amazing hairstyle was popular. And this is a book called Vintage Hats and Bonnets, 1770 to 1970. So those puffy sleeves and that extreme hair appears to date from uh, the early 1830s. Amazing. So hopefully that matches one of your Hannah's. Let me know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maureen. 
Right, that brings us to the end of the pre-submitted questions. What we're going to do now is try, in the last 10 minutes, look through some live questions. Um, Maureen, if you have seen any in the comments that you would really like to address, please feel free to click on them, bring them up on screen. I will scroll back up to the top and I will see if we can find any. And we'll just try and get through as many as we can. And I'm just, just going to scroll click here. Click on it, it will share it. Yeah, if you click onto the comment, it will appear on screen so everyone can see. It's not doing that for me. <clears throat> oh, is it not? No. Ah, that might be because I'm... You're the one. A... You're the driver. I'm the driver, yes. That's All what. right. So, yes, uh, Sue Kelly, I will try and share my postcard with the family of Ethel Cliff. You've all given me so much information that now I have to write up the blog post. So watch my blog and my newsletter. Um, people are just, it's just, the information is just streaming in. So you've solved it for me <laughs> pretty much, I think, uh, which is great. Go to my blog and see if you can help me with Helmuth Voigt, please. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one from Joyce, which we touched on a little bit earlier, actually. I've got a bo box of negatives about 100 years old. What is the best way to capture the images on them? Scanning them is really the best way. So you scan them and then you reverse them. So you make the negative a positive. And you don't know what you, you know, you're gonna see some great surprises in those negatives, guaranteed. Brilliant. Okay, here's a question from Karen. How should I be labeling pictures that I have scanned from family albums, pictures that contain the same people and place, but different variations in terms of pose? So you can, label them with the name of the people and the place if that's not already there. But when you're scanning these, like if you know that you have 20 photographs of the same person, then that's one of your folders for scanning. You wanna scan them all together so you don't have to move them around on your hard drive, which will take you forever, trust me. Um, different variations in pose. I don't worry about different variations in pose. You just wanna label them with the person and a date. Um, and a place, if you know. Lovely. Um, somebody said, is it, Judith says, is it easy to recognize a studio background in a photograph? Oh, Judith, if only there were a master catalog of backgrounds. <laughs> oh, that would studio be backgrounds so much are easier. A pain. Yeah, it, but no, but sometimes you can spot things in the painted backdrop that will key you as to where that might have been taken based on where your family lived. Okay, here's one from Anita. This might not show the entire comment, Anita, so apologies. We've been searching for a photo of my husband's grandfather. He has never seen a picture of him. His grandfather destroyed them. He died in 1944, an RAF reservist's leading aircraftman. We have his RAF record, newspaper articles about his death, we have all the normal genealogical records for him, and we've searched Facebook groups, RAF ones, local history ones, local groups to see if anyone with the same surname is there, eBay, Google, and revisit these places regularly. Are there any other, I think what she's gonna say is, are there any other places they can look for a photograph? Is, well, where do military photographs end up? Uh, like here, they end up in our national archives or in a special place called Carlisle Barracks that has a, an archive as well. I am not familiar with where UK World War II images are stored, but I'm assuming he would have had a service image taken at the time he enlisted by the military. Um, where would all of those be stored? I'm thinking maybe the National Archives at Kew. Potentially the National Archives. There's also the Imperial War Museum, perhaps. Um, but also remember, Anita, with um, service records for after 1921, they're not publicly available yet. Um, so if you haven't, oh, you've said you've got his RAF records, so you've already applied for that. So that leads me to so that leads me to think there wasn't a photograph on the service record. So yeah, a, a military museum or archive may have one. That's tough. That's a tough one. And as I'm sure you know, Anita, you know, you're, you're a, a very valued member of our community. You know that we add new records to Family Past every single week, including new newspapers. So you already know to keep checking back. And I really, have, really hope with all my heart that you'll find a photograph. I do too. I really do. Um, I would also reach out to other people in the um, 
RAF group in which he sh he served, because I know that uh, when my dad passed about a, a decade ago, we found this little box of photographs of men that he served with, and I That's a really good point. do not know who they are. I only recognize one of them. Yeah, so perhaps if if his RAF record should have details of his of his squadron on it, reaching out to the squadron in particular, that's yeah. a really really good piece of advice. Yeah, yeah. They um, might have some. Okay, question from Sally. This is a really good question. Color photographs tend to fade and lose their color. Is there a way to preserve the colors and stop the yellowing? It depends, Sally, on the type of image that it is. Some of the early color you know, from the 1940s and on. Um, the earlier color stuff, 1940s, is usually more stable than the ones from the 1960s, which do fade in color, you know, yellow or shift. There is no way to stop that. The only thing you can do is scan it uh, at a high resolution. My Heritage, however, has in, now added this restore color feature to their website, so you can actually bring back the colors to the original um, mm -hmm. and then save that. But Unfortunately not. I mean, you can store your color photos in the dark, which is what's recommended, but it doesn't mean they're going to stop. Yeah, I think, I think as you said, the best piece of advice is to scan it now before it, it now. deteriorates any further and don't then you've wait. got it. Yeah, don't wait, Sally. Basically. Um, and another question from Sally, all the good questions from Sally. Um, how would you go about keeping color slides safe? Color slides are actually pretty durable, believe it or not. The colors seem to maintain if they're coat of color. Um, if they're ectochrome, they have a tendency to shift. Uh, but I store, still store some of mine in my old carousel trays um, and they get, they're hidden away from light and they're in pretty good shape. There's uh, not much happening with them. So again, you can buy polyester sleeves for slides so that you can take them out. And I have some of those for my slides as well. But don't, don't fret too much about the color slides. They're actually doing pretty well, given all the other things that are going wrong with our color photographs. Oh, when I was talking about the, the record collection we're releasing next week earlier, um, uh, my reputation precedes me. I do this a lot. My apologies, everybody. I like to keep you all on your toes. <laughs> do you okay. keep us uh, up to date in a newsletter? We absolutely do, yes. Um, if anybody is not signed up for our Find My Past Fridays newsletters, um, you can do so from within your Find My Past account. If you go to your notification and email settings, you can sign up for it there and you will get news of our new records straight through to your inbox every Friday. And we always talk about, about them on Friday's Live as well. We have one question that I definitely want to answer live, Ellie, go before we it. go, because I know you're wrapping up and we're going <laughs> to cut it off. But Matthew Donovan said, is it worth keeping old negatives for pictures you no longer have? Ooh. Absolutely because when you scan that negative, you get a much better resolution than you do from the print. I'm thinking of uh, 19, late 1960s, 1970s sort of linen prints. They're horrible. Uh, I have a couple of slides that I made for a presentation that actually shows what you get from the negative and what you get from the print. Totally different. Definitely keep the negatives. Don't toss them. It's worth Amazing. having them. So that's all I'm gonna add at the end. And I will go through this chat and if there are quick answers that I can add, I'll just. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Maureen, it's been an absolute pleasure today. I have learned so much and it is so nice to chat to somebody who is so, so passionate about photographs from somebody else who's passionate about photographs. It's been a delight. So thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us. It's been really, really lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. It's been lovely being on this Find My Past broadcast. Thank you all. <laughs> Sign up for my newsletter, follow me on, you know, all the social media as the photo detective. I look forward to seeing you. Yes, absolutely. And um, a little bit of housekeeping before we go. Um, I am back on Friday. You cannot get rid of me this week for Friday's Live, where I'll be talking through all of our new record and newspaper releases. And we'll be going, we'll be talking about photographs a little bit more as well, which will be fun. So please tune back in for that. We've got lots coming up on Find My Pass From Home over the next couple of weeks too. And take care of yourselves, everybody. I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. So yes, thank you very I, much for tuning in. 
Thank you so much for solving my mystery. <laughs> yes, thank you, everybody. We love a challenge. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.